Good morning. It is the name above all names, the only name by which man can be saved. Is it not? The name of Jesus. It is above all things. Welcome Riverside Baptist Church. We're glad you're here with us today and have joined us in worshiping our Lord and Savior. And we just hope that you'll be blessed and come meet with the Lord, meet us, meet with us with the Lord uh, this morning as we worship Him. Uh, please join me in your board since we have a couple of announcements. Uh, one thing is right after service this morning, uh, we ask all of our members if they would to stay for a very brief special call of meeting. We're going to, uh, if you remember a couple of weeks ago before Mother's Day, we voted to uh, create a committee to look into updating our Constitution and bylaws and we are going to the nominating committee is going to present them to you today for you to vote uh, if you approve them as your committee or not and so that will be the only order of business as far as i understand and so please members uh, stay around for that right after service today um, 6 30 on wednesday wednesday night 6 30 we'll have prayer meeting followed by choir practice at seven and then there's nothing else really scheduled for this week so it's a fairly normal week for us. Linda? Um, I know we have this brief business meeting after, but after that brief business meeting, we would like the circle to meet very briefly over here in this Sunday school room. Just, it will be very brief. All right. Uh, ladies of circle, please meet in the Marshall Memorial classroom right after the business meeting. Anything else? All right. Do you remember the last Sunday in June is going to start our revival? Uh, we'll have a regular Sunday morning service that morning. Uh, I say regular, and I will be preaching it. And then that night, and Monday night and Tuesday night, James Harrington, our director of missions, will uh, bring revival messages for us and any of our guests. So I'd like you to be in prayer for that. And I also would like to uh, restart something we talked about, and we're almost about to have uh, in 2020 before COVID hit. If you remember that Who's Your One Sunday, it's an initiative that's trying to get all, all of the Christian people in the church to reach out to, to uh, build a relationship with one person or one family that you know who is not church and uh, invite them and share the gospel with them and invite them to come. And so we want you to use that special revival as kind of your event you're inviting them to. So think back again, remember who your one is, or come up with a new one, someone who doesn't already regularly attend the church, and invite them, uh, get to know them, uh, share the gospel with them if the Lord gives you the opportunity to, and um, become more and more involved in their life and build a relationship with them, and they are more and more likely to respond to your invitation and to hear what you want to share about Jesus Christ. And so I want to present a very uh, gospel-centered, seeker-centered uh, message that Sunday morning uh, for people who may or may not already know much about the Lord and our salvation. And then we'll begin the revival services that night. That is the last Sunday in June. We'll begin that. Any other announcements? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and particularly let's remember our revival in prayer. Holy Father God, we come before your throne of grace, thanking you for this day we can meet, and this time, and this building you have provided for us to uh, be stewards over and to uh, meet in and use for your glory. We pray, Holy One, that you would be here with us in a way that we can uh, understand your word better that we can know what we've left here, we've met with the Lord and we've worshipped Him, worshipped You. And I pray, Holy God, that You would open up the Word to us. Help us, Lord, to understand what You have to teach us. Help us to apply it to our lives and live our lives in accordance with what You have shown us in Your Scripture. I pray, Holy One, that You would convict us, uh, not only of sin, where we need to repent, but convict us of the righteous things we need to do so we will be bold about doing them. Uh, convict us of love so that we will be more loving and convict us of our gospel witness so that we can share you i pray lord that you would be with uh, james harrington and give him the words to say as he prepares messages for our revival meeting i pray lord that you would open and prepare the hearts 
of the ones around us who we will share the gospel with and invite, that they would accept the invitation that we make, but also, and more importantly, accept the invitation you make to accept you as Lord and Savior. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the boldness and the words to say and the, the relational love and commitment to these people. And I pray, Lord, that you would use us to bring them into your kingdom if they're not already members, or to help them become better disciples if they are. I ask you for these things so that we can be pleasing to you, we can be doing your work, and find when we end our lives, you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. I pray this because we can't do these things on our own. We need your help, Holy Spirit. We need your mercy and your salvation, Jesus. And we always need God, the source of our life, in our lives. And so it's in your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is all hail the power of Jesus' name.
got several people facing upcoming uh, tests and doctor's visits and things of that nature. Uh, Bill's got one coming in two weeks? June 1st. June 1st. Yeah. Mimi said her mom still has many appointments scheduled. That's about her business now is texting her mom to the doctors and back. Earl? Yeah, we need to pray for the people of uh, Israel, given what's going on over there. Pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? Yeah. Let's lift these up to the Lord. Holy Father, we come before you again. Uh, asking you now on behalf of these others that we have mentioned and uh, needs and desires that need to be left unmentioned due to, to privacy or confidentiality. But we know, Lord, that you know everything about everybody. Jesus told us that even the numbers of hairs on our head have been counted. Every little thing about all creation is your concern, O oh Lord. And so we thank you for your love and your attention. And we ask you to bless in your will these that we have mentioned. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you be with Renee as she faces another surgery this coming Wednesday. Uh, help it to do exactly what it's supposed to and to help her feet. Uh, we pray that she will be completely healed soon and not have to continue going through uh, foot and leg issues. I pray, Lord, you please continue to, to heal my dad and drive that pneumonia out of his lungs and help the doctors. Uh, get his heart in a good rhythm and, and be steady. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would be with uh, this, this Marie and this Edith and this uh, Reby and the others that are normally here but are not able to be here this morning or haven't been able to be here regularly for a good while. Lord, we pray that you give them strength and grace. We pray, Lord, that you give them uh, healing if it be your will, but guidance and peace in their families no matter what happens. We pray, Lord, that you be with Israel, the nation of your chosen people. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide them and direct them, protect them, and help them as they respond, to respond well in the way that you would have them do so in their situation, in their threat. We ask you, Holy God, that you would be with all the leaders of the world. Bring us to a better place and good relations with each other as nations. But, Lord, we know that you have complete control over the future. We know that whatever it seems like is happening and however bad it may seem to be getting, we've read the end of the book. And so we know that you're going to bring everything right. You want to destroy all evil and wickedness. And all of us who have accepted you as our Lord and Savior will live with you in your perfect kingdom here in this world and then in eternity in your perfect heaven. And so, Lord, we look forward to that day. We ask you to help us be faithful and obedient until that day. And we ask you, Lord, to bring all others who are willing to accept you into that kingdom so we would have the largest possible heavenly family. We pray that you would guide and direct us as we minister to these we've mentioned and to others in our lives, as we share your gospel to heal the soul, that you would be with us. Give us the words to say and the actions to do that will point them to you. Never to ourselves, but to you, Holy Jesus, as the role model, as the Savior, as the one who is the word of life. We ask this in your name, so you will be glorified. Amen. Choir special this morning is Holy, Holy, Holy.
old preacher say one time, if that doesn't ring your bell, your paper's broken. <laughs> You would join me this morning in the, I keep almost saying the Gospel of Genesis, the book of Genesis, the 17th chapter, we're continuing our study through the book of Genesis, the book of the origins. We are in the life of Abraham, the patriarchal father, the father of our faith in many ways, a, in many ways a role model of faith for us. And we're going to study today about one of the most important events in his life, an event that changed the life of him and his descendants. And you got to realize that even for us preachers, sometimes it's a little awkward to talk about things like circumcision from the pulpit. But the Bible does, so we are. Genesis chapter 17, we're starting at verse 1, reading most of the book. Most of the chapters, excuse me, most of the chapter. Genesis 17, verse 1. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him saying, I am God Almighty. The Hebrew for that is El Shaddai. Live in my presence and be blameless. I will set up my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. And Abram fell face down, and God spoke with him. As for me, here is my covenant with you. You will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. I will confirm my covenant that is between me and you and your offspring throughout their generations. It is a permanent covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. And to you and your future offspring, I will give the land where you, where you are residing, all the land of Canaan, as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. God also said to Abraham, As for you, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations are to keep my covenant. This is my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, which you are to keep. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you is to be circumcised at eight days old. Every male born in your household or purchased from any foreigner and not your offspring. Whether born in your household or purchased, he must be circumcised. My covenant will be marked in your flesh as a permanent covenant. If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that man will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, do not call her Sarah, for Sarah will be her name. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will produce nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. And then he laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a 100-year-old man? Can Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, give birth? So Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael is, were acceptable to you. But God said, No, your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son, and you will name him Isaac, which means laughter. I will confirm my covenant with him as a permanent covenant for his future offspring. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. He will, be fa he will father 12 tribal leaders, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will confirm my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. When he finished talking with him, God withdrew from Abraham. So Abraham took his son Ishmael, and those born in his household were purchased, every male among the members of Abraham's household. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin on that very day, just as God had said to him. When our Isaac, up in the balcony, was little, uh, about Nathan's age, about four to six, seven, one of Amanda's uncles, every time we went to visit, would start messing with him and picking at him. This uncle was named Clayton. 
And Uncle Clayton would go to Isaac and say, hey, Clayton, I'm Isaac. Good to meet you. He would swap the names and call, calling him my Isaac. Clayton. Well, as a little fellow, this bothered Isaac. Like, this upset him. At some point, she was like, Mom? It's like, no, no, he can't really change your name. The poet may tell us that a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. But we value our names. They are bound up in our identity and who we are. And that's a classic example from our family's life. And then this is innate. This is very early on. We start, we have an attachment to our names as part of our identity. And that connection to naming and meaning of names and the sense of identity that it creates is why when something is named in the Bible or someone's name is changed in the Bible, it's a big clue as to the point of that narrative. And here we have three people whose names are either given or changed and as, as of yet unborn Isaac's name is declared and given. So four names that are very significant here. So let's look at them quickly together. God names himself in verse 1. I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai is the Hebrew. And it's a name that simply means what it says. God is all powerful. And he's going to declare the things he's going to do to Abram, which requires that almighty power to accomplish. The author of Hebrews says about Abraham as a father of our faith. At this point in his life, his body was as good as dead. Not that he's super old or super frail. He's going to live for several more decades. But in terms of creating more children, we would have thought of him as barren, as dead, as infertile. He's not able to do that anymore. Sarah's 90 years old. She's certainly past the time of childbearing years. But God Almighty can change that. He can make a barren womb fertile again. He can make a man's seed virile again. And that's exactly what he does for Abraham and for Sarah. I am God Almighty, and I can do whatever I say I'm going to do, and I can accomplish my will. Is God's revelation to Abraham. Now, some of the old scholars, some of the scholars of the Old Testament, excuse me, think that we have three or four different versions of a covenant-making story. We have chapter 12, where God first appears to Abraham, chapter 15 again, and then here in chapter 17. And some of the ones who are not committed to the inerrancy of the Bible think that what has been recorded and kept are three different traditions of understanding how Abraham became the father of these people. I think differently. I think this is God revealing himself in stages, what we would call progressive revelation. God revealed himself and called Abram out of his homeland to go to Canaan. And he said, I want to bless you. And you want to have a lot of kids. And then he revealed more about the covenant promise and the blessing. And here he's being even more specific. Abraham has tried with Hagar. He's tried with uh, all these other means, I'm sure, of trying to get babies, uh, superstitions and things like that they had for helping their women become more fertile. I imagine he's gone through those processes. And God is saying here, no, it's going to be Sarah. You can't pawn her off of somebody else's wife like you did to Pharaoh. You can't go and get another uh, concubine like you tried to with Hagar. Sarah is going to give you a baby. She's going to become pregnant next year, and you're going to have a little boy. You want to minimize it. I'm God Almighty. I can do it. But he also reveals this is now, he, now he reveals this is an eternal covenant. Your children, through Isaac, are going to live here in this land forever. And I'm going to be their God forever. And that promise, God has kept. So he's revealing more about himself. He also changes the name of Sarah and Abram. Sarai becomes Sarah. Sarai is an older form of the name Sarah. Uh, they're both from the same root word. They both mean princess. And so I always kind of wondered, why did God change Sarah's name? It just seems like a, a spelling difference. Why does this really 
have an impact. Like changing Abraham's name makes sense. He goes from exalted father to father of nations. God is magnifying his understanding of the blessing. But Sarah goes from princess to princess. It's got to be nice that he's right to be named princess. But why change it? Well, Sarai, with an I, is an older form of the name. And I think that's the major uh, revelation here. Sarah is the newer form of the word. It is a younger form of the word, if you will, linguistically speaking. Younger form of the name. And so she's being renewed. She's being revitalized. She is being uh, restored. Still a princess. Still want to give birth to people who will become kings. But it's a newness, a revitalization of her in a motherhood sense that she was never able to have. A coming to life, reproductively speaking, biologically speaking, she is being rejuvenated. So if she gets a younger, newer name, it's still a beloved, valued name. And then finally, of course, Abram becomes Abraham. He goes from exalted father to father of nations. And I think it's an act of faith that Abram changes his name and lets everybody know that his name should be changed to Abraham. So try to imagine it from Abram's point of view. 75 years old, you don't have any kids yet. You move into this new place, start traveling around. You know, as we saw, he made friends and allies out of his neighbors, like Mamre. So you can imagine him going up. Hey, Mamre, my name's Exalted Father. Mamre's like, nice, that's a great name. Those young ones over there are yours? No, no, those are my slave's kids. How about those pretty girls over there? Those are your daughters? No, it's not the slave kids. Well, Exalted Father, where are your kids? No, I don't have any. But your name's Exalted Father. Yeah, well, your mom didn't call it right, though, that did you? I imagine he got some gentle ribbing. Now, this man is wealthy. He becomes powerful, so they respect him. But I imagine if he had friends, like we often do with each other, they're ribbing him a little bit and gently chiding him and things like that. And then 25 years later, he comes up to him, Hey, guys, you can no longer call me Exalted Father. My God, El Shaddai appeared to me yesterday and changed my name. About time. Because you still only have one kid. And he ain't that great. He's kind of a wild guy. So what's your name now? George? Fred? Steve? No, I'm the father of nations. <laughs> they had fun with that, I'm sure. Can you imagine telling a bunch of people, everybody around you, all your servants in your household, you've got to call me the father of nations. This is my one child. By the way, we're going to cut off some of your private parts. God said so. But this is the faith of Abraham. This is the complete faith, absolute faith that he has that God is going to do exactly what he says. And so Abraham goes with it. Abraham obeys it. Okay, you might pick on me. You might think this is crazy. My God knows what he's doing. So I'm going to follow him. I'm going to do what he says. He says he's going to make me a father of many nations. I'm taking that to the bank. That's the kind of faith Abram has. And he obeyed that very day. He and all his household got circumcised. Now, they didn't have painkillers. They didn't have, I'm sure they had some kind of ointments and whatnot. But this was a painful procedure. And they had days to recover. We find out later that sort of thing took days to get back to, uh, to normal after for the public. And they obeyed it the very next day. I don't know about you, man, but me, I've been trying to talk that out of that one. Seeing if we can maybe negotiate. I definitely won't be doing it the next day. We've got to get ready. we got to get a whole bunch of ice or something. Abel's like, God said, do it. I want to do it. Get the man, line them up. Clean your knives, sharpen them. Get the birth certificate. I'm going to change my name. That's sign it. I'm Abraham now. This is the immediate reaction of a man of faith. And that's why he's the father of 
the faithful. Paul later uses him as an example not to show people that they're not saved by following the law. Abraham lived several centuries before Moses received the law. But Abram was made righteous because he believed God. It says Abram believed God and he credited it to him. God credited Abraham as righteous. And that belief prompted him to immediate obedient reactions and actions. So this is how that real living faith that is credited as righteous works. And I want you to think that the act of circumcision is what saved Abram or any of the Jews. Now they will later become very proud of their status as God's chosen people, as circumcised people. It will be a sign of their relationship with God. But we see here that Ishmael was circumcised. The Ishmaelites were not God's chosen people. Isaac had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. They were both circumcised, we assume, but only Jacob was chosen. And Jacob's 12 boys became the tribal founding fathers of the nation of Israel. The Old Testament is full of men who are Jewish men, we can assume circumcised, who rejected the Lord as God. They, we see wicked kings, we see false prophets, we see evil, uh, selfish priests, who probably had circumcision, but did not have a faithful obedience to God. Circumcision didn't save. So I don't want you to think that circumcision is kind of like our baptism. Circumcision is more like our child dedication ceremonies. Where the baby born is born into a family, the people that follow God and profess God as their Savior. But that baby's got to grow up and make his or her own decisions about if he's going to follow God or if she's going to rebel against him. So circumcision is being made part of the people of God so they're ready to become people if they so choose to accept and to follow the Lord. It was a sign, God said, a sign of the covenant. But what was Abraham's job as a covenant? Live in my presence and be blameless. Walk before me, your translation may say, and be perfect. Well, that's a tall word. It's an order no one ever filled but Jesus Christ. So he's the one who can make us perfect before God through his atonement. It is not something we can do in and of ourselves. But this story with this naming and name changes, I think tell us a little bit more than just the origin of circumcision. I think it's a little bit more than even an example of faith that Abraham models for us and we should follow. It reveals to us that our very identity should be called up in our covenant with God. Abraham and Sarai's identity changed because of the covenant they have and the agreement they have with God and their willingness to follow God in faith. And so a name changed. What is it a name, the court may ask. Well, I say the name is your identity. Who they are is defined by their relationship with God, which is defined by the covenant. And I think that holds true throughout all the time, that who we are is defined by our relationship, our covenant relationship with God. Because each one of us should go through a time where maybe our name doesn't change, but who we are changes. We go from a time where we are a rebel against God, dead in our sins and trespasses, a slave to sin. The Bible has these sort of metaphors for who we used to be. And then we repent of our sin and ask Jesus to save us and we become a follower of Christ. We enter into that new covenant which he established. He tells us at the Last Supper, right? This is the blood of the new covenant that's shed for you. When we enter into that covenant with Him by repenting of our sins, asking Him to be our Lord and to cleanse us of our sins and save us, we become His follower. 
The Bible says the old is gone, the new has come. We are made new. We are dead. We now live again. We have a new identity. I usually tell people before I baptize them who you were without Christ died. You are now you with Christ. You are now yourself in Christ. The Bible says you are a new creature. So we have to have a new identity, a Christ covenant centered identity. And we know some of what this looks like, right? We know we're a bunch of Christians here who have been in church a long time. You know that when you go to work, you should work like you're working for the Lord. You should be an employee who is a Christian and reflects Christ. When you're at home, you should be a parent or a child, a sister or a brother who is a reflection of Christ as he would be a brother, a parent, a child. Our social interactions, we should be identified as a Christ follower. Even in our private times, in our private lives, our, our leisure time should be identified as Christian, little Christ. So we know being a Christian impacts more of our life than just Sunday morning. But the very nature of Christ giving us our identity, our new identity, goes even deeper than that. I think it addresses two of the most common problems people suffer in our culture. One is the, the self-esteem, self-image problem. The rates of depression, the rates of suicide have gone up steadily for years. I want you to listen carefully to what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm not saying Christians shouldn't need counseling or they shouldn't ever go to a doctor or a therapist. I definitely am not saying don't take your medicines if you have mental health issues. I take my antidepressant. It's helpful. Right? I see it like I see these things. My glasses. These things help me visually to see reality correctly. My mental health meds help me see reality correctly. Because I, without them, did not see myself and others rightly. They help. And I'm not saying do without them. But what I am saying is along with any medications you might need, counselors, hopefully you've got a Christian one, they're wonderful people and helpful. But the root can be addressed by the gospel. Because the root of our self-image and our self-worth uh, problems can be addressed by the gospel because the Bible tells us we are so loved by Christ. We are so loved by the God who made the universe that he was willing to give his own life, lay it down, in order to buy us back from sin, to buy us back from our, our rebellion, even though we had willfully committed it. That's how much God values you and me and every individual out and about in the world. When we really realize that truth about our value in Christ, that should also help change the way we see ourselves in the world around us, the people around us. So our identity should be we are co-heirs with Christ. We are adopted princes and princesses. Ladies, all of you are a Sarah. Especially Sarah's. <laughs> all of you are princesses. Guys, all of us are princes. We are sons of the king of kings. Adopted. Adopted doesn't make us less valuable. It means he loved us enough to choose us and come get us and pay for us. You guys know by now one of my favorite verses. 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it's 6, 11, 6, 20. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Bought with a price. The price tag to buy you back was very, very, very high. And God was willing to pay it. So our self-image problem is one major problem our culture has. The other one is kind of the polar opposite. It's a pride problem. 
And we own the people like that, right? Who feel like they are entitled to everything. They are God's gift, not just to women or to men, but God's gift to the world. They are all that in the whole bag of chips, they think. They are full of themselves. We know people like that, right? And everything around um, everything in the world around them has to revolve around them. Their decisions are, are selfish and short-sighted and hurtful to other people. Well, the gospel also addresses that pride problem because as valuable as we are to God, it's not because of anything we've done. It's not because of what we've done to earn anything or be deserving. We are all poor, wretched, lost sinners who deserve hell and damnation. And these two things don't contradict. We deserve hell and damnation. God loves us so much, he doesn't want us to die and go to hell. But if we can see that this is what we deserve and humble ourselves, then we can recognize how wonderful our Savior is. And the gospel can bring us out of either one of those two problems, those two mental misperceptions of who we are. So we are valuable kings and queens of the Son of the God of the universe. Not by anything we've done to earn it. We are humble, lost wretches that He has elevated. Our identity should be those two things brought together into one, harmonious whole. Because that's who we are in Christ. People He loves not because we are so good or so worthy, but because He is so good and He is so loving. And like Abram, who became Abraham, when our identity is found in the covenant we have with God, it changes how we act. And it impacts what we decide to do. Because first and foremost, it will be to obey that king, to do the will of that one who saved us, who knows everything and loves us, so we can trust that what he wants is what's best for us. As we approach our invitation hymn, near to the heart of God, I just want to ask you, is that identity? Are you a child of the King? Raised out and rescued from your own sinfulness that you couldn't get out of. Maybe you've never accepted that new name. By the way, a wonderful thing, Revelations 2, verse 17, John is told by Jesus, to tell the church that those who persevere to the end, those who remain faithful, the saints who endure, are going to be given a wrong by God with a new name. A special name that only God and you would know. God's got a special pet name for you. But it's bigger than a pet name like Sweetie Honey Pie. It's your real full identity in God. He's going to give you your name. Are you in this family? Is that your identity? If not, come forward and I'll show you from the Bible how you can become a child of the King. But maybe it already is, but you're having trouble living that identity. You're struggling with one of these two great problems I've talked about. Or you know it doesn't come out like it should at work or at home or when you're around other people in society. We can't be who God wants us to be by ourselves. So there's no shame in coming and asking Him to help you. Because that's the only way any of us can accomplish it. So whether you need to come and get saved, come and ask for help in living the saved life, or want to come and join this church so we can live it together. Whatever the Lord's putting on your heart, please come as we sing near to the heart of God. As they sing, sorry.
members please stay and we'll go right into that business meeting real quickly. Uh, one more thing with, uh, I told you guys that last week I was hoping to go home, gas shortage changed that and that was in the hospital. Uh, we might go home this week if he gets out of the hospital or mom needs us. So things are kind of up in the air about what's going to be best for them. Uh, I'll send out an email, Calvin, I'll call and let you know. So people in the know will know where I am. And all of you found on my cell phone. Uh, just let me know some things will come up in the air this week. But uh, we'll be back next Sunday unless something drastic happens. Okay? That's right. Holy Father God, we do come before you thanking you, Lord, that our identity can be found in you. So many people in the world try to make their identity about their success at work or uh, even their family or uh, where they're from and things of that nature. Uh, but those things don't always satisfy and don't always give us purpose. But you are what we need. And we were made to have a relationship with you, intimate and, and holy. And Lord, I thank you that you came and died and came back to life so that we may have that holy, intimate relationship with you that you made us for. And so I pray that you help us to live that out, that your follower, Jesus, your son or daughter, the mighty king of the universe, will be our identity. Let us be both confident in you, but humble in ourselves as we walk this identity and live it out to the world around us. I ask you for your blessings on all these who are gathered here and listening to my voice on the recording, and I pray that you will bless their families and bring us back together next week to continue to worship you together in spirit and truth. Amen. Guest, you are dismissed.